In the 1850s in Boston, there were 350 blacksmiths registered. And those 350 smiths were specialists on making edge tools for cutlery, axes, saw blades. Some were making household hardware. Others were making fireplace cranes and andirons. And then there were the farriers that shoed horses. After World War II, these were all more easily and cheaply made through manufacturing processes that mass produce these same items. In the early 1970s, a lot of Smiths realized that there was this potential loss in what had been a viable profession for over 3,000 years. And so we tapped some of the older Smiths that were still working to be able to share information, things that would have been very difficult to have ever found inside a book. There was still a demand in the home building industry to supply hardware for homes. I decided that I would concentrate on uh, Spanish colonial door hardware. I can say that this range of the work, traditionally oriented forge work, really helped solidify the functional basis for understanding the trade. I grew up in Tulsa, Oklahoma. My father was an amateur archaeologist, and my mother was a quilt maker, and taught us, my brother and sister and I, how to work with our hands in lots of different ways, from growing a garden to building our homes. Julie and I and my children, Kate and Irene, and a number of friends, and my brother and his family helped build the home that we live in now, and the shop as well. If I get too big of a shovel for you, thank you. Yeah, Santa Fe is a place that it's completely acceptable to build your own house out of the backyard. Being able to make a house right here from the materials at hand is something that has been really rewarding. My folks separated and uh, divorced when I was 12. And mom moved to El Rito and invited us out during the summers. And it was during three different summers that I spent time with Peter Wells, a blacksmith and a printer. He had a small blacksmith shop and taught me about blacksmithing. He realized that I really wanted to, well, wanted to take off in a serious way with the uh, forge work and so offered the uh, shop and house and uh, the land that it was sitting on uh, for $27 a month rent. I was 16 then and was uh, trying to finish high school, but realized that I could make a living as a blacksmith in this farming community and uh, so set out to do that. The fact that I was given one opportunity very early on to experience forge work has made it very important for me to be able to pass on information to young people as well. And so I decided that I'd open up a free program for young people that wanted to learn forge work. It's been great to see their level of enthusiasm rise with each working day and recognizing their own skills being fine-tuned little by little by little. I want to teach them right off the bat how to make their own tools. These are the tools that we'll work with for the rest of our lives. We make most of our tools. For every size of material on my racks, I need a pair of tongs that'll hold it securely and safely. Over the years, producing work that looks different from project to project uh, requires making certain chisels and punches and uh, hammers and set tools and flatters and fullers and all the different tools that blacksmiths use. And so the accumulative effect of a lifetime of, of working means that your walls are full of tools. So you can see against this window artifacts that I've collected over the years. Each one of the pieces has something to teach about the way that a smith has approached a particular design. In this case, I've always been really inspired by this shovel. Now, um, this shovel is made for a very clay soil. The smith has forged it into simple tines that allow the clay to be released after um, the soil has been dug. Because of the way tools have played a fairly important part in the way that I think about my own designs, I discovered some of the African forgings that have been made based on farming tools. There's a whole range of currencies that were forged for over 2,500 years. 
this is a type of currency that's almost identical to a forged hoe, but yet it'd be bundled together and then brought to market and exchanged for different things. This particular type of bar currency is forged from uh, a number of worn out hoes, so the, the farming family would save the hoes as they become unusable. They're gathered together and forge welded into this bar that's offered during Momoye marriage ceremonies. This type of bar currency was made by the Toma and Kissi people, and this one's about 250 years old. And the interesting uh, part about this shape is that it has a fishtail forged on one end and a bird wing forged on the other. And the Toma and Kissi believe that in order for a community to thrive, that really the currency must move as freely as birds fly and as fish swim. So the symbology of, you know, design is absolutely integrated into the piece so that it's a constant reminder inside this community the, the importance of sharing. A lot of the commissions I've been given over the years usually start out with a design basis that can be expressed in a contemporary way by expanding it to a scale that makes it abstracted. Looking around in the landscape, there's all kinds of inspiring shapes and forms that I end up using. For instance, grama grass is a great arcing seed head in the autumn, and this has been used in room dividers that intersect and come out three-dimensionally, as if a breeze is moving through the house and that the iron is opening up based on this gentle movement. As a blacksmith working in El Rito as a teenager, I always knew that I would work with sculpture. I have always drawn, worked with other materials, clay, wood, paper, and iron ended up being a way that I could find livelihood for my family at the same time as thinking about the potential uses in a sculptural mode. The earliest working sessions with clay ended up giving me an understanding of the plasticity of iron. When iron's hot, when it's heated up to over 2,000 degrees, it works much like hard clay so that anything one can visualize in clay, one can also produce in forged iron. I've always been interested with the residual aspect of materials that have had a former life, and part of that stems back from spending time as a smith in El Rito where material wasn't plentiful or it was too costly, yet the arroyos were really full of old wagon parts and car parts, so I would drag these pieces back to the shop and it was a ready source of scrap material that could be easily reused. Most iron that we use today is also recycled. There's very little of it that's made from brand new ore. It's always mixed with maybe 60, 70 percent scrap material. It means that I'm actually using stock that could well have been a hundred different things, going back perhaps hundreds of years, certainly in New Mexico to the colonial period where iron was a precious commodity. Realizing that each one of these pieces that I was working with had this history made me recognize the potential for being able to do public art projects that were really integrated inside the community in a way that no other material could be. I was asked by Jake Rodriguez, the architect, to design a vessel that would go inside of a 7,000 pound chunk of granite that was the baptismal font for Santa Maria de la Paz Catholic community. I wanted to engage the entire congregation. I would ask all the parishioners to donate pieces of iron, something that they could recollect a story about towards the making of this patchwork piece that encircled the bronze basin where the babies would be baptized. It becomes a living memory or history of this particular community. The Albuquerque Museum of Art asked for me to make entrance gates for the sculpture garden between Old Town and the museum grounds. And I decided that I would ask community members to be involved in a reclamation process whereby we would clean about a quarter mile stretch of the Rio Grande. There were lots of car bodies and 55 gallon drums and shopping carts. We gathered up hundreds and hundreds of pounds of material that was heated up to 2200 degrees and forge welded together into these panels. 
It's a story that talks about how these materials kind of wind their way back through our lives and the responsibility that we share in discarding these pieces as well. In 2005, I was invited to work in a forging factory outside of Chicago. It was an industrial forge that produces some 250 million pounds of iron a month. I had approached the president of the company to use their equipment and work with a team there to realize sculpture on a larger scale than I can produce in my own shop. And the request was to work with their scrap material. Now you can imagine in a shop that's producing 250 million pounds a month that some of the pieces they're making are 30 and 40,000 pound pieces of iron. Being able to work with their scrap, which might weigh anywhere from 1,000 pounds to 10,000 pounds, was really exciting. Taking these fragments, I forged and folded as if kneading bread so that everything recognizable was kind of sucked down into the middle and folded up around so that fresh material was brought to the outside. Uh, one example of this is in the sculpture titled Bloom. It's made of nine components that have been turned inside out and forged to create this void in the middle where the outside skin of the original piece is now resting concealed in between these folds. In looking at a large forging in process and working with the scrap ends is an indicator of something much larger that's now deployed out in the world. So another sculpture inside this body of work is called Berg and these bergs are forged from the tip of something much larger that's out there. You know, I'd go ahead and take out that thing okay. as well. The process of making it is to take the scrap, whatever shape it is, forge it into a bar that's almost as high as I am and about uh, 17 to 20 inches wide. While it's still laying horizontally, it's squeezed between the press dies and, and a machine that can grab hold of it very tight on the other end and twist it. Uh, clockwise 120 degrees so that the cuts realign and shift from a square cross-section into almost a round cross-section. Then the piece is stood up on end after it's heated again and is compressed between the press dies and is squeezed until the breaking point is nearly reached. And then the pieces are like boulders turned on their edge. This pile of boulder-like forgings are made from the punch slugs uh, that the company produces whenever they make a hole in anything. It's a cylindrical piece of iron that comes out of the middle of the forging. I would gather up these punch slugs and under the presses manipulate these cylindrical chunks and produce this faceted rock-like shape. The rock form being representative of rocks and sticks that extended the human blow beyond the fist and thinking about the part that iron has played in times of conflict. These iron chunks will have a drilled hole inside of a depression on the bottom of each one where soil from battlefields from all over the world will be placed and then a plaque will go over the top and seal the soil inside the boulder-like shape with the name of the people the place of conflict and the time period in which it took place. This cairn will grow and really is a memorial piece for all wars ever fought between all people. And it's not about, you know, which side of the fence one is on. It's just a recognition that there is almost no land left on the globe that hasn't been fought over by some people. Many of the people that I'd grown up with in Oklahoma, when I mentioned that I was going to quit high school and begin uh, working as a smith, they were shocked and feeling as though I was setting myself up to fail, that it was a bygone profession, one that had no viability left. I've always been interested in where around the world blacksmiths are still deemed indispensable within their communities, satisfying the needs of industry in every imaginable way. And I realize that I'm also a part of this thread, this continuum of a profession that has been and continues to be placed dead center in the needs of others. And this choice about how, as blacksmiths, we produce the work that is going out in the world continues to be a very key component of the way that I think about the material itself.
a story I once heard about a Dogon blacksmith who takes a small fragment of his own hammer, cuts it off, and forges a new hammer for his apprentice, and fuses a piece of his own hammer into that, so that in the same way as, as the smith's hammer was passed to him by his teacher, and likewise his teacher's teacher, it has this fragment being passed on generation after generation after generation, so that when this young smith raises his hammer, he's raising the hammer of every ancestor who has ever forged before him. Thank you.